What's up, everybody? It's Kevin. It's a Wednesday morning. Uh, let's see, April the 29th. And like always, or like for the last several weeks, I'm with you live every morning at 8 p.m. Pacific, uh, 11 o'clock a.m. on the East Coast. And this is uh, one of the highlights of my day these days. Um, so thanks for coming, hanging out. Got a great guest today. Bjorgman, and I'll introduce him in just a second. I uh, just want you to know that I'm drinking, for some reason, instant coffee this morning. My daughter mm -hmm. saw the um, whipped coffee challenge and all that stuff on YouTube and stuff, and she made me some whipped coffee yesterday, and I think it hooked me or something, because this is not whipped, but it's definitely instant. Um, so maybe we'll talk about coffee later. Um, some people think I'm a coffee snob. I'm not necessarily a coffee snob, obviously, or I wouldn't be drinking instant coffee. But hey, uh, so if uh, for you guys jumping on, if you haven't met me yet or if I haven't met you yet, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Kevin Ward. I'm um, the author of a book called Pro Tools 9, the Mixers Toolkit that I wrote with Nathan Adam. I run a website called Mix Coach, and I'm interested in... Um, teaching you to mix better if I can. So this is why I come on live every, every day, talk to you about little mixing techniques. I find that the best convert the best tips and stuff happen in like normal everyday conversation. So that's what I'm trying to do every day. So um, if you want some uh, three of my best tips on how to get um, a better radio worthy mix, um, go check out my, uh, my resource that I've got at mixcoach.com. Um, I think you'll like it. I think this coffee's kicking in. I'm talking really fast. I've noticed. I think the coffee really, really is kicking in. Okay. So, hey, uh, say hello in the comments. I, I'm flipping over to the comments now. Hey, Adam. Hey, Mark. Hey, Isaac. Good to have you guys here this morning. Let me shut this door. Um, so, let me go ahead and introduce Bjorgman. Um, Bjorgman and I, uh, we talk every pretty much every week now, but I feel like I don't know that much about Bjorgren, which is another reason that um, I love these kind of conversations because it's going to be a conversation between he and I. I'm going to find out a little bit about uh, his journey uh, to where he is now. Um, an American, he's from Iceland, and he's also an author. And he's been he's an OG on in the audio blogging world. Um, he's been blogging since uh, 2006. So he's been uh, like when the internet was first invented. Bjorgren jumped right in. Uh, I don't know if he was in Iceland when he discovered the internet, but uh, in 2006. But um, anyway, he's here this morning. I just want to tell you a couple things. He uh, he just wrote a uh, best-selling book called that we're going to talk to this morning. Talk to you about this morning. Morning, John. Morning, Davy. Um, we're going to talk about step-by-step um, uh, -step mixing with only five plugins, which I love because I did a challenge a few years ago, and it was one plugin and one reverb and that's all you could mix. And I, the response was great. And I think I'm going to do that again. So I'm interested in talking to him, Bjorgren, about his um, his five uh, plugins that you can mix with. If it's five specific plugins or if it's five general categories of plugins. So anyway, I've told you enough about Bjorgren. You probably already know him. So anyway, Bjorgren, there you are. Welcome. Hey. Hey, man. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This is great. Oh, this is fun, man. I love this. My, one of my, it's my favorite part of the day, except, you know, going to sleep uh, <laughs> or eating, you know, but anyway, it's right up there in the top three. Sure. Uh, so how are you doing? Where do you, where do you live, Bjorkman? I live in Tucson, Arizona. It's uh, two hours south of Phoenix, uh, kind of a border town, uh, desert, de small city, university town, um, uh, Real, real nice. It's it's just the right size for me. I couldn't do L.A. and I, I couldn't live on the freeways of L.A. Yeah. So this this is perfect for me. They're really not bad these days. Traffic is, is <laughs> very tolerable else. right now. <laughs> um, uh, we got uh, Steve from England and uh, Dan's here. And uh, we've got somebody from Carnes, Australia. I hope I said that right. Davey's here. Um, anyway, so these are names I haven't seen. So these are maybe guys that you already know. But uh, anyway. yeah, one of my one of my coaching students, John Owings, is here. Oh, uh, awesome. hey, John. Welcome, John. Second. Ken Fox is here. Hey, uh, so tell me, um, I've never been to oh. Tucson. I've never been to All Tucson. Right. What is Tucson's calling card? What what what's the what's the thing? That, what, if I had one thing to do in Tucson, what would it be? Besides, come uh, see your studio. Eat. Eat? 
Yeah, it is. It is a uh, UNESCO city of gastronomy it has like a specific denomination and is very well known for its food. It has the best. I mean, I'm sorry for all you Californians out there, but it has the best Mexican food in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I hate to I hate to uh, I hate to say this, but I, I miss the uh, the Mexican food from Tennessee. It's a different flavor of Mexican food. I, I don't know. People in California say it's more authentic, but uh, okay. they don't have cheese dip here. Do you have cheese dip with your Mexican food in Tucson? Well, it depends on which restaurant you can, you go to, but you have uh, there's all all there's a wide range of options you can get here. So you're saying uh, there's a chance? There's. A, there's a chance. <laughs> well, I may have to come to Tucson and see if I can check out your studio, and uh, and get some cheese dip and some Mexican food, right? Uh, hey, so, so, Bjorvin, like I said, we talk pretty much every Friday morning, me, you, yeah. Lidge, Ian, uh, several guys that, that these guys probably know already. But other than just a few like side conversations that we've had, I really just want to get to know you a little bit this morning, honestly. So um, I know you're from Iceland or, oh. or used to live in Iceland, uh, born yeah. and raised in Iceland. Tell me, tell me about your journey from like young Bjorkman in Iceland and how you got to Tucson, Arizona and, and add some audio stuff in there along the way. Yeah. 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 No problem. So, um, so born and raised in Iceland, except for a brief, uh, brief stint in the U S when my mom went to graduate school in 89 to 91. So that's where I learned English. And that's why my, that's why the Icelandic accent isn't, uh, like the, I don't speak like the normal Icelandic people. <laughs> you do now. <laughs> that's cool. Well, yeah, so my accent is a little dull from just learning I, I, English at a very early age. I always um, liked English in general, and I think that's one of the reasons why um, I've dedicated, well, basically dedicated my life to learning it by writing, <laughs> writing in it. Mm -hmm. um, but born and raised, and then in, I became an, a musician very early on, uh, played instruments, was in bands, and then got into audio production in 2006 when i became a live sound engineer for sort of an up and coming or an underground music venue i was half youth center half music venue and i learned the ropes there basically uh twisting knobs and figuring out what all the numbers of the frequency spectrum did uh to the sound whenever there's a rock band in town and that's how i sort of learned the first thing first little things about eq and then the boss, my bosses at the time were very encouraging of, of me diving deeper into learning about audio. So I decided to go to audio school in Madrid, Spain, back in 2008. So I moved to Madrid uh, at the height of the crash, uh, watched my currency, all of my savings I had saved up the year before of working live sound, doing a lot of really... Uh, big events in Iceland, all uh, big concerts and, and 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 events like that, and I saw those savings just dwindle in uh, as the exchange rate to the euro was just falling, free falling back in the height of the crisis. Uh, so I managed to uh, I managed to make my student loans uh, last though, and went to audio school and got a diploma in audio engineering from the SA Institute in Madrid. And at that time, I met a girl that was backpacking around Europe uh, through a mutual friend of ours. And uh, we started dating and hit it off. And it was, uh, we basically fell in love. And then she moved uh, to the US to go to law school in Tucson, Arizona. And I finished up my studies and left, uh, instead of going back home or instead of going to another SAE campus to finish the uh, second year of school to get a quote unquote bachelor's degree in audio production. Um, I moved here to check it out, see what, 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 what it was about. I absolutely hated Tucson at the start, uh, mm. uh, uh, in the beginning, because it was quite the culture, ex culture change from, you know, the metropolitan Madrid where, uh, the, just the, the completely different vibe in, in every way obviously mm -hmm. i've i've learned to love it and now really really enjoy tucson and everything it has to offer but i moved here went to school went to instead of going and getting some bachelor's degree in audio production i decided to just go to 
uh, business school and get uh, get a degree in uh, business economics and entrepreneurship. And around this time, I was blogging about audio and audio issues was sort of born based on me while I was learning audio in at the SAE Institute, I was blogging about it and sort of teaching myself better by writing everything down. Basically, audio issues was an extracurricular activity that then did become a final project in in school. Mm -hmm. And then I didn't ever stop writing. And then it became a business out of that. That's cool. So you, you said you got your audio kind of education, the, the official education, which I know we're all still learning, but you got it in Madrid. It, what, what, uh, okay. A couple of questions. I've been to Barcelona, never been to Madrid. Have you been to yeah. Barcelona? Yeah, I've, I've lived in uh, multiple places in Spain, uh, a very short period in Madrid, also, uh, no, in Barcelona, very, uh, a year, over a year in Madrid, but I've also lived in Salamanca, which is a university city right outside of madrid mm -hmm. and then in sevilla which is sort of the capital of the south in andalusia yeah so is the vibe still like uh, say i've been to i've been to barcelona but but the vibe there was really cool like i got up one morning oh, yeah. and it was like 10 o'clock in the morning and the, the streets were like it was like four in the morning right, uh, it right. was like empty I mean, late uh, it's like you don't even get started so you don't go to dinner until 9 p.m is that the right. way it is all over spain yeah, very, uh, very similar. Barcelona yeah. is a little, you could call it more cosmopolitan, I guess. It's more mm -hmm. European, whereas Madrid is, is has stronger Spanish roots. And I think some of it has to do with the fact that it, Barcelona is in Catalonia, which is, you know, wants to be its independent state. So I'm not going to go into the politics of, of, of Spain right now. But mm -hmm. Madrid is obviously the capital of Spain and is a slightly older city and has that sort of older vibe to it. Although it's very metropolitan, uh, I went back last year actually for the first time in 10 years and a lot of things had not changed at all and some things uh, were completely different. Mm -hmm. Well, so you got your education um, in, uh, you got business and uh, another degree, but where, mm -hmm. um, where did you learn to ride? Is it something that you've always uh, just had an affinity for or something you make yourself do? Because you ride a lot of a lot of material. You've been blogging pretty much probably every week since 2006 and you've written several books. Mm -hmm. And I don't I don't know how you do it. I, I feel like uh, I feel like I've got another book in me. And so I want to know, uh, where do you get that writing bug? Where, where would you pick one of those at? Oh, well, so where, where can you where can you buy them on Amazon? Yeah, <laughs> uh, I want to put it in my coffee. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Uh, well, how, caffeine definitely does help. Yeah, <laughs> but it is. Um, I mean, it is very much like anything else. It's just practice, routine, and making it a habit. Uh, I've been writing in one way or another about and blogging. You know, if you go way back and can't understand Icelandic, you can find a lot of my Icelandic blogging from while I was in Spain and, you know, writing about random things. And for some reason, they were also how to's at that point. They were like how to be a poor college student and, and survive in Spain mm -hmm. when your economy is tanking yeah. and things like that. Yeah. But it, you know, the more you do it, the easier it becomes. And I also I also started doing audio production, writing and audio education by being a freelance writer. So I wrote the first mm -hmm. year or so, well, actually not the first year, first first five years, I think I wrote for audiotuts.com, which is uh, one of the Tuts Plus websites and that taught audio production. So I have about 100 tutorials on that website wow. since since 2009 that I wrote, just kind of on a, uh, on a freelance basis and just got paid for you know, writing about very specific techniques. And that's kind of where I got, I got the practice down to where it would take me maybe four hours to write a thousand word tutorial. But then at the end of it, it took maybe 30 to 40 minutes or something mm -hmm. like that. You yeah. know, it just gets faster because you, you get, as you get faster typing and as you get faster at, at writing. And also if you read, as much as I do, it becomes easier to write because you remember so many different turns of phrases and so many ways to describe things mm -hmm. that, you know, it's really all about reading and writing. <laughs> so, yeah.
Well, so so that that kind of uh, kind of bridges the the topic that I want to talk to you about today. Your latest book is called Step by Step Mixing with Only Five Plugins, and I th- yeah, there's sure there it is, is right there. Um, <laughs> so they can find those, that on Amazon, right? But we're going to give them we're going to give them a cliff a cliff's note version of it today. So yeah. So without uh, I know some guys here are getting anxious about hearing about the step-by-step mixing with five plugins and I am too. So, so give me the, give me the, 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 uh, the quick version step-by-step and the five plugins. I'd love to hear that. Yeah. So uh, step-by-step mixing, it's basically just the process that I take when I mix the song and the process that I like to teach, because there's a little bit of a difference between mixing as uh, somebody who that's just responding to the music and is listening at such an expert ear level versus a uh, a novice that maybe doesn't know what to do next so i list out a good systemized process to take and then the five the plugins is kind of a misnomer it's really just marketing (laughs) Mm -hmm. but but what i really talk about is the five processors that are the most important to get really good sounding mixes and Mm -hmm. it's sort of it goes back to maybe my business principles of the 80 20 rule what are what's the 20 percent of the stuff that you need in order to get to 80 percent of the results Mm -hmm. and in my case i would say that it's eq compression reverb delay and saturation Uh, mastering those five fundamental processors or plugins uh will will enable you to get as close to a uh, quality mix uh, as po- like uh, you you can really get really great mixes going just by understanding how to use those. And so the book basically goes through that entire process. It talks about obviously organization set up and set up volume and panning and sort of, you know, list basically mixing with no plugins, mixing just with the faders and your and sort of your appreciation for the music and what's important and what what needs to go where in the stereo spectrum and then there's you know dedicated chapters to eq compression reverb delay and saturation and then make then there's some you know supplemental chapters about how to get your mixes to translate to each speaker system uh and how to mix with headphones if that's all you got and sort of how to just keep the momentum going and and keep practicing your mixing skills yeah. So, so the plugins, um, compression e- or EQ compression, they're not in any in particular order, right? EQ compression, verb delay and saturation. Let me talk about yep. saturation for a second because I use all the other stuff, but, um, I don't tend to use saturation a lot when I mix. So let's break that one down. I only, only okay. hear a little bit about the saturation part. Yeah. So I feel like saturation can do a lot of really cool things. And obviously saturation is a broad term. Uh, what I, I tend to, think about saturation as something to add a little bit of warmth or a little bit of um sort of character to a sound not necessarily using it as as a distortion mechanism Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's more it's more about getting you know using tape and tube emulations to get uh added harmonics and added character from the tracks that you have a really good example is you know if if you put a tape a tape plug in uh, across your mix bus something kind of happens to glue things together Mm -hmm. the high end doesn't get as harsh the low end gets warmer and things of that nature so i use it all over the place one of my favorite plugins these days is the shep's omni channel from waves because it kind of it if i were to make a plugin it would look very much like that because it has saturation compression eq and it also has an extra insert slot so that you can add a delay or a reverb if you so wanted to. So it's almost like a mixing with five plugins, plug in and one. Pl- <laughs> and one <laughs> yeah, that's um, cool. I use the Shep's Omni Channel um, live. I, I don't have it in my studio yet. I probably need to go ahead and purchase that for my studio, but I've got it. I use it live all the time. And I, that's my go to really these days. I saw an engineer use that. Um, at my church when we had a conference and and uh, the things you can do with that particular plugin, great. Um, yeah. what's so um what's another what's another go to um, character plugin um, that you use like that? 
Carriage Boy that I use like that. Uh -huh. I use the I use Logic and I use the Amp Sims a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and usually for weird stuff, like I'll put them in parallel, and I'll use I'll put an amp on on a par on a parallel bass chain to add additional harmonics to the high end of the bass so that it cuts through in the mix, for instance, things like that. Uh, I I like a lot of the wave stuff. The CLA guitars is a great cheat plugin when you're like, I want this guitar to sound great and I don't have time or don't want to try to figure out how to EQ compress and do all this stuff. I'm just going to slap the CLA plugin on it. Mm -hmm. I really like that one. Uh, I always have a stereo stereo widening bus, which has an opto compressor, uh, an LA-2A, if you will. It, it's not an LA-2A, but it's just an optical style compressor. Mm -hmm. And then it has the S1 imager from Waves. So it's just widens everything out. And then uh, I love the Pro Q3 as a plugin. It's not a character plugin, but it's, it's, it's beautiful when you need to do surgical EQing, mm -hmm. especially in dynamic mode. I uh, just got that one, so I'm pretty pretty pumped about it. And that's by who again? Because I, I use Fab that. Filter. I, Fab filters, yeah. They have the best DSer that I found, I believe. Uh, I haven't tried oh, their yeah. EQ. So I their EQ, that EQ, is it a dynamic EQ or is it just a straight up parametric it, EQ? It's both. It's whatever you want. You can make the bands dynamic if you want to, but you don't hmm. have to. Okay. So it's like a mid side dy dynamic standard stereo EQ. Is it like, um, it's yeah, it's really worth versatile. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we got the the five plugins, and mm -hmm. and they're and, and that's 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 great, and that's I think that I use those quite a bit too. So yeah. walk me through the the steps. I mean, are there are there how many steps uh, do you feel like generate a good mix? Well, I think that uh, people might sometimes overlook the importance of just taking an extra 10 to 15 minutes and work on the balance of mm -hmm. the mix. So the step number one is really just, I mean, if you were to look into the table of contents, it's really just step one, pre-mixing is really just listening to the song, deciding what, what's important, mm -hmm. uh, whether all the tracks are, you know, as they should be, are they all edited and all that sort of, uh, or, or all that sort of prep work. And then mixing with volume, and then using EQ. First, if there's any, if there's anything quote unquote wrong with the tracks, for instance, are there resonances in the tracks? You know, mm -hmm. is there a weird snare drum resonance that you need to EQ out? Uh, so a lot of EQ fixing, if you will. So I put EQ maybe EQ first and try to get a good sound that way. Get everything balanced. Getting getting everything heard. And then I'll use compression in a lot of different ways. There's, you know, you can use one compressor, you can use multiple compressors in series. If you don't want to compress a lot at the same time, you can use bus compression on, on buses. You can use parallel compression. I uh, use a lot of parallel compression tricks. Um, so that chapter in that step has, it's a lot of, there's a lot of if this, then that statements in the book. So basically mm -hmm. if this is what's happening to you, or if you've, if uh, you're working with a track like this, try this. If you're, so it's basically just a million suggestions mm -hmm. uh, that you can use to sort of walk, walk your way through your own mixes. Mm -hmm. And then reverb and delay is, you know, basically adding space and depth, uh, from there, I tend to do a mono static mix with EQ and compression on a mix cube, just make, making it sound as good as I possibly can on a fairly poor speaker. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'll flip it on to the Focal speakers, which are now they're actually flat tuned by the Sonarworks Reference 4 system that I just got yesterday. Uh, and that's been a real big help in making me understand the frequency spectrum of my room that although it is fairly tuned, I have good monitors, good acoustic treatment all around. Uh, having no, having the knowledge that you what you're hearing is completely flat gives you a lot of uh, confidence. Right. And then from there, I will, you know, throw it into stereo and start adding uh, depth with delay and and reverb, I tend to add saturation at 
first and sometimes at the end. Saturation is sort of goes in between. And sometimes it's EQ compression and then another EQ, you know, and then maybe another parallel compressor or things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, and then, you know, use a re using a reference mix and uh, finishing your mix, getting it to translate, getting it to bounce out uh, correctly so that you can, he you know, you can hear it here so that the mix sounds as good as possible on every speaker system, not just in your not just in your studio speakers, but also on your earbuds and your Amazon Echo and your sound bar and, mm -hmm. and in the car, places like that. That's obviously very common. It has to sound great everywhere. And especially if you're if you're working in commercial music that is going to be heard, it has to sound good on commercial speakers. And that mm -hmm. means speakers that don't sound as good as your monitors. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the process. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, I I think that's a that's a great process. I'm uh, curious about your uh, following up just a little bit with your mixing mono in the cube. How mm -hmm. relevant do you think mixing in mono is these days? Uh, I think, well, relevant as to like, is everything in stereo always, or what do yeah, you mean? I mean, uh, like uh, a lot of a lot of mixers think um, this is 2020. Uh, right. Do we really need mono mixes anymore? How how would you respond to that? Uh, I don't necessarily think that we need mono mixes anymore, but it's the last opportunity not to to be able to make things sound good in mono. It's just, mm -hmm. if anything, it's just helps you train your ears better. Yeah. I think I people might uh, think this is a myth or or disagree with me, but I think panning in mono is actually a thing. Like mm -hmm. you, you can hear, you can hear the instruments going, not maybe from left to right, but they're going definitely going in between the instruments when everything mm -hmm. is summed into right. the center. I totally agree. I've got a couple of examples. Uh, one is that I was on a flight one time and I had mixed, um, I mixed a lot of songs that were on the radio and I was on a flight, popped in my earbuds and turned the uh, serious thing to the yeah. channel that my stuff would have been on. And one of yeah. my songs popped up and it was in mono. It wow. was as mono as it could be. And I'm like, I'm really glad that I spent 80, 20. You're talking about 80, 20. I'm really glad that I spent 80% of my time balancing this thing in mono because this is the first time I've heard it since it left my studio. So there's right. one example. You never know when you're going to hear something mono. And if you don't, if you're not mixing for radio um, and you, and you don't think your song will ever be on radio, then, <clears throat> what about the times when you're you've got your focals or your your big nice stereo monitors and you've never even listened mono? When you walk outside the door, all of that sounds coming through the door, which is a mono door, <laughs> right? So so I think I, I'm I'm glad you mentioned the cube thing. Now I don't mix on the cube a lot. I don't have one. I used to have uh, an Aura tone <clears throat> way back in the day. Um, and I hated mixing on it. It, it didn't, it didn't make me want to mix for long, <laughs> but I do triangulate a mix on, um, uh, NS tens. I love yeah. NS tens. I don't know if you have a pair of them, but no. it's just the ones that I cut my teeth on as we're yeah. and, and it. And it's that fine line between, um, it, you can still enjoy a mix on the NS tens, but they are so real world, real world. I, I find that, um, there's no better place to, um, to find how loud your vocal is and if it's going to sit in the mix or how loud your snare, if it's going to be too loud or just not quite loud enough, the yeah. NS tens for me are those speakers. And then I have, um, and I'm also <clears throat> glad that you mentioned listening on different sources. Cause I think that's one thing that, um, that a lot of people miss when they, when they're mixing, they think if I can just get the focals or if I can just get the bare foots or whatever, if I just had that ultimate set of headphones, I know I could get better mixes. And I think that there's a fallacy there because I bought a pair of really expensive monitors um, a few years ago. And I found out that they would tell the truth in a lot of areas, but in a couple of areas, they, they lied to me and <laughs> my $50 pair of headphones told me the truth. <clears throat> so it's really cool that you mentioned mixing on the focals, mixing on the cube, mixing on headphones. Um, I haven't thought about mixing on Alexa, but maybe I will. Well, so it's, it's funny you mentioned the door, too, because uh, my kitchen is just right outside the door here. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's all tile and, and all that. So sometimes at the very end, I'll just crank it real loud on the focals and then I'll just listen in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Just through the door. 
in the basically it's a, the hallway trick which somebody came up with uh but it's you know it's my kitchen trick i guess <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, uh, and that that often gives me um a good good clarity on like what is too loud what is too boomy uh, and things like that Right. I think there needs to be one more step. And I don't know if you need to put it. You know, you're not going to put it in your book because it's finished. But there needs to be a uh, it's right after the hallway thing. It's like bring your wife into the studio and let her listen to it. Because <laughs> I always found out that, you know, when I when I wasn't sure if I was finished or not, you know, I, yeah. I knew I was almost out of time, but didn't know if I, I some something about somebody sitting in your chair, listening from the position you are and you standing over them and trying to listen through their ears somehow brings things to the surface is like, Oh yeah, that vocal's too loud yeah. or ask them, you know, I, I find that that, that that's another pretty important step for me is like letting somebody else hear it. Even yeah. if, uh, you know, if we listen in the car, uh, driving down the road on Dropbox, right. you know, uh, I find that that's really revealing. Uh, do you do that? Uh, I, I tend to not do the car listening as much as, um, people, other people do. Mm -hmm. uh, I do a lot more listening just in like on, on the Amazon Echo and on my earbuds and places like that. Uh, mm -hmm. But I will tend to I will I will go to the car on occasion, but mm -hmm. it's not necessarily a part of of the process. Always. You, you just don't have the right car. You're yeah, it's too it's too hard to. You know, I always have to connect the thing through Bluetooth and then I have to find the thing on file pass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've got, uh, there's something about my little Honda element that I've got. Uh, there's just, it says, it tells me stories about my mix that I haven't heard from any of my other monitors. It, okay. believe it or not, it tells me whether I've over compressed something. If I've, okay. if I've over baked a two mix, or there's an element in there. Maybe I've got the, the ratio on the, the dry to wet uh, compression, parallel compression, and I've got a little bit too much wet in there and it's growling a little bit too much. My car will tell me. Huh. And all, all my other monitors are like, well, it sounds fine to me. So I love my, I don't know what I'm going to do if I ever sell my Honda. Um, yeah. But anyway, okay. I got, a, I got a question for you then. What is mm -hmm. your workflow for mixing through the Alexa thing? How do you do that? Oh, I don't mix through it. I just play. I just like bounce. Usually I bounce it. If I'm, I, I'll bounce it out, put it. Um, well, I use file pass to share my mixes with clients and students. Mm -hmm. And then I just hook it through Bluetooth to, um, to the echo. And I just listen to it there in the kitchen because I listen to a lot of music while I'm cooking and I don't have a fancy hi-fi system in the kitchen. So I just use the echo, uh, which does the job. Mm -hmm. uh, it's entertaining enough. Music is entertaining enough if it's entertaining enough, not necessarily if it sounds yeah. uh, perfect, you know. Yeah. But and then I just you know listen to it there and and see if there's anything that pops out that sounds weird. Usually it's usually it's like the low mids of the bass. A lot of times those sorts of speakers will tell you whether your bass is too sort of hard. It's like not boomy, but more like there's too much like three to five hundred on it. It's just like kind of pushing too much it's kind of has this like hard roundness to it mm -hmm. That's, uh, that tells me like that it's like speakers like that mm -hmm. will often tell you whether your mix is smooth enough or not yeah that's cool well um <clears throat> Bjorgren, we've got some questions coming in uh that i want to i want to try to get to uh, there's a long string of communication here uh there was a couple of really good questions in here um let's see Okay, here's one. I know you've written a book about this, about or at least a, some kind of resource about this, about uh, getting making money uh, as a mixer. Um, yeah. So what, what advice would you give Davey here? He said, I have a business degree struggling to find if, uh, if there's any money in mixing. Can you help me navigate this? All right. Um, <laughs> question of the day. All right, here's my real brutal honesty. Uh, I would work on your grammar. <laughs> the spelling thing? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if I got an email that had that many typos in it, I wouldn't respond. Oh. Well, uh, so I think he may have said that. That's the answer. <laughs> um, but there is, I mean, I know I've seen a resource from you where there's like, 
what was it? I think I downloaded it and it was, it was brilliant. It was like a um, hundred ways to make money. Uh, mixing. Oh yeah. 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 T- tell me like maybe two or three of those for Davey. So, so yeah, it's the 70, 70 ways to monetize your music career. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think, Oh man, there's, there were so many like, in my case, I have multiple income streams. It's I get I get paid for writing, I get paid for coaching, I get paid for mixing, I get paid for my courses, I get paid for playing music live, I get paid for uh, teaching business, I get paid for promoting other people's products that I believe in. Those are just like a few of my own things. So like I don't, it's been so long since I wrote the 70 ways to monetize your music mm-hmm. career, but it's a lot of that. So like there's, there's sync, li- sync music licensing. A lot of my students are working on there's um, like writing jingles for places like audio jungle.net or audio hero. There's a really good book called the super bedroom producer. And um, I would definitely read that book. You can read it in like an hour or two and it gives you a really good uh, business model on how to. (laughs) Thanks, David. Yeah, I appreciate you having a sense of humor for it. (laughs) Uh, So those are just a few of the few of those, uh, you know, creating creating content, monetizing your content. uh, And it all goes back to understanding who the audience you're trying to serve is, you know. Yeah uh let's see yeah those those are all good the music sync thing it it, it seems like to to me the the common thread there of what you mentioned is just keep creating stuff right yeah Yeah. keep creating stuff and find a good place to put it yeah and especially when it comes to like musicians um like there's this thing i call the hard drive graveyard Uh uh, and it's where all your songs go to to die or become (laughs) zombies basically yeah and like pe- and what what i've noticed especially with my insiders community is people have these songs and musicians have these songs that they've just had sitting on their hard drives for sometimes over a decade and they're like this this is great like we should work on this we should release this and i think a lot of a lot of it is just overcoming the sort of mental block and and gaining the confidence to decide that like this is good enough to put out yeah and then also your first single, your first song, your first mix, it's not going to be the one that makes you. It's going to be mm-hmm. like the hundredth or whatever. So keep doing, keep creating, keep making music or working on music in whatever way. In my case, um, I'm heavily into writing more books now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I go in waves. I'll do a lot of mixing and then I'll do a lot of writing and then I'll do a lot mm-hmm. of teaching. Uh, now I'm in sort of in book writing mode while also in, in sort yeah. of teaching. So, Davey, let me jump in here because uh, it looks like this is a topic that's uh, that's near and dear to his heart. He says he has mixes up on SoundCloud of various genres. I think they're OK. I think he was just having a bad typing thing. He said he couldn't see the script and he couldn't see uh, what, I'm, what I'm finding locally is you just get picked on uh, by local engineers, producers, if you cannot track and act in a room as they do. I suppose the difference in a lounge room tracking session or more dedicated room. Hey, Davey, let me jump in there just for a second. And I'd love to hear Bjorgman's opinion of this. In my opinion, if you want to, if you want to bring attention to your studio and, and I'm taking for granted that you've got a studio that's worthy of, of putting a band in or whatever your niche is, if it's vocals, then vocals, if it's uh, track and drums or, or band, whatever, then go for that market. Here's what I would do if you want to, uh, and then you got to have the skills. And I can say this with, with a hundred percent transparency. I've never heard any of your work. I don't know if you're good or bad. Um, so grant, uh, taken for granted that maybe you are good at what you do. Here's what I would do. I would go to some of those bands and I would do, uh, I would say something like this. I would say, hey, um, Rockstar, um, I just built a studio. I've got a, I've got a recording studio uh, at blah, blah, blah. It's here in town. And uh, I'm trying to kind of flesh it out. I would love for you guys to come by, help me out. I would love to record one song for you. And uh, it's on the house or it's for um, X amount, like deep discount rate. Like it would be almost a no brainer. I wouldn't recommend doing it for free. Um 
because you're going to get taken advantage of that way. I would I would do a low barrier of entry. Uh, the band comes in, let them see how organized you are, how good, how much you can add to their band. And then while you're doing it, granted things are going well, say, hey, um, I'd love to talk to talk to you guys about doing your next single or whatever. That's what I would do. And I would hit, I would hit all the local bands for that. I would even hit bands that are, you know, maybe stay overnight and, you know, not at your house, but, you know, stay overnight in town while you record them because word of mouth uh, between those bands is going to carry on. And you're going to, you're going to find out if you're good, basically if they, uh, or find out if you're not good and we're all learning uh, find out how you can improve yourself as a producer, as a mixer. That's what I would do. Jorgen, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, it's interesting. He says he says the in another comment, the key is cracking it locally, I feel, rather than t- trying to leverage out to the Internet. And and that may be true. But honestly, like I don't really work locally at all. Hmm. Like I and and. To be, I've just I've always worked within the limitations of needing to be location independent, and that's why audio issues is so is is what it is today mm-hmm. is that I can do it wherever. But I also think that I I like your idea of like you know do it one on the house, not necessarily doing it for free. But if you want, you, sometimes you have to start with free work. But you should always treat free work as an actual session that you're just like giving a hundred percent discount on. So like, mm-hmm. what are the expectations? What are the revision process? What is the process for the band? They can't mm-hmm. take advantage of you. You have to set serious expectations of what you expect from them if they're going to come in. And be prof- they have to come in and be professionals about it. They can't come in and treat your studio like the rehearsal space. You know, mm-hmm. there needs yeah. to be set expectations on that. And maybe you do need to do some free sessions in order to build a portfolio so that you can put that on a website and yeah. then start promoting that. The most important thing I think you could do, Davey, is do something like this. Do it at a discount. Do it for free if you need to. But don't pretend like it's free to them. Pretend like you are charging them your top dollar and that's how you treat them. You treat them. You you have snacks in the studio. You uh, you set out the expectations like Jorgen thing, because that's a slippery slope. If you say if you say I'm mixing this for free, somehow everybody thinks uh, there's 100 recalls included in that. And it's not you need to act, go at it like they've paid you your top day rate for for doing that. And then and then flesh out your system because um, you need a system for doing this. Don't act like you're lucky to get the work, Um, although you should be grateful. uh, Don't 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 cower down to ridiculous demands or whatever, but flesh out your system. I mean, because you they're not necessarily buying your mix as much as they're buying your system for getting a good mix. And if you're included into that, then good. But your studio is in there. Your snacks are included in there. Your studio vibe is included in there. So that's what I would do. And I'd love to hear. Uh, I'd love to hear eventually what um, what becomes of this. You know, I, what one I'll leave it with this. I've never tried this with a full band before, or I, at least I teach my guys that are like just built a studio. I say, here's what I would do. Do you have a relatively new vocal mic? And they'll say, yeah, I do. And I said, well, what you need to do is to get this artist you're working for and say, hey, would you do me a favor? I want to try my mic on a good singer. You're not you're not BSing them. You're not you know, you're not trying to tell them a story or anything. You say, I want to use my mic on a good singer. I was wondering if you would come by and and sing a song on this mic. Let me see how it sounds. See what you think about it. And then that's your chance. You get a chance to go. Well, I had no idea. This guy's pretty good. Um, and then you'll you'll probably get some session work out of that or um, or you won't. And if you won't, you know, there's a lot there's more education in that even. So anyway, that's that's what I would recommend. Um, so hopefully that helps. Keep me posted on on, uh, on uh, how that turns out for you. OK, um, I've got a couple other questions in here uh, and I haven't read these yet. So hopefully they're good questions. Mark Jacoby. Since both of you are mixers and I work with Kevin now, uh, what are your thoughts about an artist to get mixes from different mixers to get different views on his or her songs? My thought has always been five mixers, same song, get five different mixes. Uh, I think that can be a pretty expensive endeavor, Mark. Uh, you yeah. know, you know, paying five mixers to mix five songs and then you pick a mix, but you will definitely find out uh, who's the who's the best mixer. Bjorkman, you you have any thoughts on this? 
Yeah, well, I mean, let's assume that he's not talking about it being easy uh, to get mixing engineers to work on spec, uh, because that's that seems that seems to be undervaluing the, the the value and the quality that the mixing engineers bring to the table. Uh, it's just as creative of an art as anything else, and so yeah, it's it'll be expensive, but you will find out a lot about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I would, uh, yeah, like I said, I think that's going to be, uh, I think a lot, you know, I, I don't think Mark's talking about uh, on spec, but if you are, I find that the, a lot of the good mixers usually stay busy and the busy mixers usually are not looking for brand new clients. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, that's definitely a good way to do it. Um, you know, send your, send your mix out to several guys. I mean, that could definitely work. Mark, uh, it's also you're, you're trying to look for a relationship in a way. So like you want also want to make sure that you jive personally, I would, mm -hmm. I would say. Oh yeah. Relationship is everything. I mean, uh, having the, having the, uh, the trust built into an engineer to go, um, you know, it's it, uh, sometimes it's like, you know, you can tell the engineer, hey, I'm not vibing on this uh, verb you got. And for the engineer to have a, a strong enough relationship with you to not go, well, you know, I quit then. Find another mixture. That's my favorite reverb. And, you know, you, you got to build that relationship. And also on the other side, you've got to build trust with an engineer that says it's not the verb. That's the problem. It's the it's the drums or it's the it's the way things are tracked or or. Yeah give me a shot at recording your, you know, guitars next time. Um, I think there, there has to be a trust thing both ways. One of the smartest things I feel like I did was built a relationship with a, with a mastering engineer, because if you don't have that relationship, you're like, you're kind of rolling the dice on your mastering engineer and, and he sends you back whatever, and you have no leverage to go. Eh, I like what you did on the other song. Can you do that on this song? I mean, you don't have any relational um, foundation to pull it on. So I think you should build relationships with engineering. It could be five engineers. And like I said, that it could be an expensive endeavor to get five guys to mix the same song. Yeah. Um, so. Well, it's, it's funny. Like my business model is actually quite different than most mixing engineers because I do mostly mixing training and education. And I have students and customers rather than clients mm -hmm. uh, most often. So... I tend to mix a lot of stuff uh, either for free in exchange for to use them for, you know, video tutorials or courses or trainings for um, for my audience as a whole, which is a win win for both of us. You get a free mix and I get uh, to make content that, you know, sells the books and the courses and, and my materials in, in that sort of way. Mm -hmm. But you also get I also am able to create a relationship with with those people as musicians and, and potential clients in the future. So yeah. I like creative solutions to entrepreneurship. Uh, and maybe that goes back to some of the, um, some of Davey's questions there was, you know, is there a creative way in which you can solve the problem that you're having? And also don't think of the problem that you're having. Think about the problem that your customer is having and how you are solving it for them because nobody cares about your, uh, problems they care about mm -hmm. their own so if you're thinking about the musicians problems as opposed to uh, your own problems then that's an easier mindset for you to mm -hmm. be em em empathetic towards your potential clients mm -hmm. hey Davey and let me jump on uh, one more thing just I, I had a thought about this and I don't know um, exactly what you're if you're if you're trying to compete with the other studios in town, because you said something about them laughing at you or something like that. Uh, what I would do too is consider building a relationship with those studios. Maybe, you know, if your if your studio is maybe set up for vocals better than anything, maybe take your tracking session to those studios and, and you know, in exchange for like, uh, you know, when they get ready to do vocals and they are double booked or whatever, they send them to your place. Um, you, like I said, I think the the take home for this is relationship. You've got to have relationship with with bands, and you build that by saying, you know, hey, come check this out. I'm, you know, help me out. 
help me test out my mic, uh, come play my new drums, um, and, and building relationships with studios going, hey, uh, I, I want to bring you some work. Um, you know, that sort of thing. So, um, okay. A couple quick questions and we're running out of, we're running out of all the time. Uh, man, this has been like a, a, a <laughs> blast and a breeze. Um, Samuel says, if I wanted to submit music for jingles, what are my options? You mentioned that. And I was wondering if you had a, maybe a couple places in mind that, that they could submit jingles to. Well, the only, um, a friend of mine that went to school with me has a, a lot of success and on audio jungle, but there's a lot of libraries out there and I would just recommend reading uh, books by people that are more experienced in that air, area than I do, than I am. And then, and I think the bedroom super producer is the book to read for that. Um, mm. Like, unfortunately, I just don't have experience creating music and submitting music. That's just not my area of expertise. But there, I know that there are a lot of libraries out there, and uh, some are exclusive, some are not. And I think they're uh, a diversified mix and uh, is, is a good bet to have. And I would recommend you going to Amazon and reading The Bedroom Super Producer in the next two hours if you really want to... Uh, move forward with with your idea. Boom. Right. Go read it in the next two hours if you want to get some if you want to learn how to do that. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> OK, yeah. hey, this, we've got time for one more question, but it looks like a really good one. And it's going to cover uh, both of our faces. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> lean up, Bjorkman, so we can see over the see the question there. Um, I have a track of Irish music, which contains three tunes, fiddle, piano and Bodron. Oh, Bod Bodron. I, I've never. Bodron. Is, okay. I've think, never, I don't think I've ever mixed one of those. A then it's, tuned a, drum. it's what? It's a, it's a tuned drum. Oh, is that the one they hit with a little stick like this? I'm not entirely sure how it's played, but I've, I've done a, a lot of uh, Irish <laughs> traditional folk, Irish folk music in the last few months, well, actually. <laughs> well, he says that uh, segued away into uh, a larger band, a fiddle, banjo, cello, flute, Boudron or Boudron, uh, which segues into an orchestra, piano, lead, fiddle, too. It looks like he's got several styles. Obviously, the orchestral part has a lot more going on. How to mix uh, going from a few instruments to a larger group of instruments, keeping the volume in control in the same track. Do you have any any insight on that? Got a couple of ideas. Yeah, I would probably start with the bigger track. Uh, so start at the end, start at the, get, get the orchestra, get like everything sounding as good as possible. And then working on the smaller arrangement and, and you might find it easier to just mult tracks as opposed to using automation. I'm, I'm assuming these are sa the same tracks and then just there's being added to them. But if, and if they are, I would maybe just mix them slightly differently or mix them you know, if, if they're the same track, mix the big track first and then see what's missing from the smaller arrangement and then maybe mult them to separate tracks and treat them a little differently so that you can have more control over the transition period. Yeah, that's brilliant advice. That's exactly what I would do. I call it mixing the fat part of the song because when you look at the Pro Tool session or whatever, yeah. you look for the part of the song that's got everything in it and the kitchen yeah. sink. And if you can make that in mono uh, sound really good, then really, uh, and I know Chris Lord Algae does the molt thing. You know, when he can't seem to get enough volume out of the vocal, he just yeah. creates a duplicate track of the vocal and and rides them together. So um, I, I, I am not afraid to push uh, the master fader up even, uh, if need be on those sections where, um, but what you wanna do is like, when you get all of that stuff mixed in, um, what you want to do is spot check your song, go to the big part of the song, go back to the front part and make sure that it's not dynamically too different, depending on uh, what you're mixing it for. More pop standards need to be, you know, in the K12, K10 range when you're mixing it, as far as I'm, as far as my experience goes. And then, uh, but if you're mixing more orchestral music, which it sounds like you are, 20 dB of difference. And what I mean by K20, K12, K14 is that the difference between the peak, the, the hottest of the hot and the lowest of the low is only 20 dB or 14 dB or 12 dB or 10 dB. Um, 10 dB is a little tight. It gets, uh, especially with this kind of music, I would keep it 20 dB, but spot check it and make sure that 
at no point unless the music stops and then you can't just pull the noise floor up to 20 minus 20 B DB. You have to kind of use your discretion on that, but just make sure that the song can flow and it doesn't sound like it's drastically different songs. But I think the molting idea is brilliant and, and mixing the fat part of the song. That's a yeah. great question, man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, dude, it's almost been an hour since we started talking and, uh, and, uh, yeah. I was, you know I was nervous you, maybe we wouldn't have anything to talk about. We, we got a whole other episode. Yeah, you want to go another hour? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I've, got an, I've got to actually mix. Um, I'm mixing audio for video today for my church. We did we cut a bunch of um, um, live songs at church the other day uh, since we're all shut in and can't yeah. actually go anywhere. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to go actually mix those today and shoot another video. So I, I've got my plate full after this. Oh, yeah. Too. Yeah, I, I got a chapter right this morning, and then I actually have a podcast. I'm starting my, uh, I'm starting a podcast experiment at 2 p.m. on my own YouTube live. And, okay. Uh, me, me, and a collaborator were talking about influences, influences and references. It's I basically saw that. about songs, and then uh, how you, our favorite songs and our influential songs, and how we think they are important to use as references and inspiration for our, yeah. for your songwriting and productions. Yeah. I'm big on references. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's one of the things that I cover in the course that I talked about. It's one of the things that I covered. I, you know, I have a playlist uh, full of mixes that I listen to. If somebody hands me a country song or if somebody hands me a rock song or whatever, I have what I feel like are the de facto standards of that genre. And I will reference those every time. Now, whether or not I'm able to get it close or it was recorded close enough to be able to attain that is yeah. another subject, but I always shoot for it. It's like, yeah. you can't not reference mix. So I'm glad you, you're, um, that's another thing I've learned about you just in this last hour is that we, we think a lot, we think similarly on some mixing topics, you know, mono, um, mixing, uh, you know, several different reference monitors, mixing the fat part of the song. Uh, we call it different things, but we we're in agreement. So I love that. Um, so yeah, uh, Bjorgman, before we go, uh, you've got a couple other things coming up this week, including a happy hour, which sounds kind of fun. I may uh, see if I can come to that. So I don't know if you can paste it in the, in the, like a link where they can click it in the chat and go to it <clears throat> or, uh, or if you want to copy it in the, private chat i'll uh, we'll post it up there and maybe maybe we'll uh, come listen to your um your okay, hangout so what do you do on these uh, happy hours so i just take questions i just uh i just have a beer and uh it's at 4 30 on on some on some 30 uh, thursdays and uh i basically have a running list of questions that people send me via email and I also take audience questions during the happy hour. So I'm usually on for about 30 minutes to an hour, depending on the amount of questions. And I just hang out very similarly to this and just answer questions and uh, share a virtual beer with my audience. I mean, the beer is real, but the hangout is real. It's a virtual beer. Yeah. <laughs> a virtual cheer, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, well, I pasted the link, uh, the, the, uh, the hangout, uh, yeah. if I, if I am, uh, yeah, it's five o'clock somewhere <laughs> time zone is Pacific, correct? Yeah. It's, it's so, 30 on Pacific time. Yeah. So yeah. And that's on, that's this Thursday. You said you don't do it every Thursday, but this Thursday is, is one of them, right? Yeah. This is one of them. I do them, um, mo most Thursdays, but it really just depends on my schedule. Yeah. Well, cool. I may drop by and uh, and uh, ask a few really, really hard, non-answerable questions. Okay. All yeah. right. Like, what's the best doll? <laughs> the what's one you'll like compressor. <laughs> <laughs> Impossible questions. Yeah. Man, it's been an honor and a pleasure and a lot of fun to be able to talk yeah. to you. And I look forward to us chatting on Friday. And uh, yeah. hopefully I'll see you. Uh, I'm going to try my best to make it to happy hour. It just depends on how this mix goes, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, so maybe I'll see you Thursday. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Oh, one, one other thing. That's the happy hour. Where can they find you? I'm going to, um, I'm going to take paste it right here. It's audio dash issues, right? Yep. Uh, audio dash issues.com. And then just, if you want to download my mixed translation cheat sheet, which is basically my process to make things sound as good as possible on every speaker, you just go to mixfinisher.com. 
Okay. Mixfinisher.com. Yep. Okay. I just posted uh, the audio issues in there. Uh, let me take this other one real quick. Mixfinisher.com. Yep. See if I did that right. Look in the comments. That's right. I thought I put Fisher in there, which <laughs> probably on that domain too. But <laughs> hey, Bjorkman, I will let you go. I'm going to go get another cup of this uh, super uh, high octane coffee because I think uh, I think I'm talking a little faster. Maybe I'll mix <laughs> faster too. All right. That's good. I'll see you, bud. Thanks for coming on. All right. Yeah, for sure. Bye. All right. Cool. That was a great conversation. Um, yeah, some really good good stuff in there from uh, Bjorkman. Thanks again, Bjorkman, for, for coming on. Hey, um, check out mixfinisher.com for Bjorkman or audio-issues.com. A lot of really good content on there, including an article called 10 Things I Hate About You, um, which uh, is uh, not about you. Don't take it personally. He doesn't hate you, but but you should read the article. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, so if you would like to know more about what I'm doing, I've got a resource for you at mixcoach.com. Um, and, uh, it's, it's three of my tips that will help you mix better by the night guaranteed. Uh, I hope you, I hope you'll, uh, I hope you'll read it. Okay. Tomorrow don't have a plan for tomorrow, but I am going to be here at eight o'clock tomorrow. And, uh, maybe with another cup of this because my palms are sweaty and, uh, who knew instant coffee could make you talk faster. Well, now I know. So anyway, okay. I will see you guys tomorrow. Thank you for coming. Um, I will see you at 8 a.m. tomorrow. See ya. Bye.